Chaos in Silicon Valley, AI innovator Sam Altman is fired only to be rehired within days, raising some questions about the future of artificial intelligence. Hello, I'm Arnold Knight and this is The Heat. When technology firm OpenAI fired its CEO, Sam Altman, last week with little warning or explanation, the move sent shockwaves throughout Silicon Valley and beyond. Late Tuesday, in an equally dramatic turn, Altman is back as CEO of the firm he helped found. There are a host of questions yet to be answered, but first this report from CGTN's Mark New. Many people here are saying it's been one of the wildest weeks ever in Silicon Valley. Let's recap what's happened so far. On Thursday, OpenAI co-founder and CEO Sam Altman actually gave a speech at the Apex CEO Summit touting how generative AI will be the most transformative and beneficial technology humanity has yet invented. No indication of trouble brewing then. On Friday, reports indicate Altman was attending the F1 Las Vegas Grand Prix. He gets a Google Meet call in his room from the board telling him he's fired. The board puts out a blog post that Altman had not been candid in his communication and no longer has confidence in him to lead. CTO, CTO Mira Mirati is named the interim CEO. On Sunday, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella announced that he's hired Altman to lead an advanced AI research team. Microsoft is a major backer of OpenAI. On Monday, former Twitch CEO Emmett Shear is named the new interim CEO of OpenAI, but 95% of OpenAI's employees signed an open letter threatening to quit if the board does not resign and if not, Altman is not reinstated. Now, Wednesday, in a clear sign of victory for the employees and a loss for the board, OpenAI posts this message on X. We have reached an agreement in principle for Sam Altman to return to OpenAI as CEO with a new initial board of Brett Taylor, Chair, Larry Summers, and Adam D'Angelo. We're collaborating to figure out the details. Thank you so much for your patience through this. Larry Summers is former U.S. Treasury Secretary. D'Angelo is CEO of Quora, and Brett Taylor is the former Salesforce CEO, who has also served as chairman on the board of directors of Twitter before Musk acquired it. Mark New, CGTN, Palo Alto, California. There is much to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Ian Khan is an emerging technology futurist and founder of Futuracy. Amir Awadala is the founder and CEO of Vectara, a website and app search platform using advanced research in AI. Also with us is Tom Tali. He's a columnist and the author of Artificial Intelligence Basics. And Ray Wong is the principal analyst and founder of Constellation Research. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Ray, let's go back to the beginning of all these developments we've seen over the past week, to the initial dismissal of Sam Altman. Why was he fired in the first place? Yeah, I think it's important to understand that OpenAI had a nonprofit board with a mission really to talk about responsible AI, fair AI, trying to get AI to the right point where it would actually balance between the good for humanity and, of course, effective altruism, making sure that robots didn't come back to kill us. Um, that was the intended perspective. But the challenge was the business model, and the business model was not there to actually support the commercial interests to cover their ability to actually get to um, you know, all the public good that we've seen since ChatGPT. So the board was really worried about all these extra curricular things that Sam Altman was working on. For example, a new chip that would actually make it easier for OpenAI, new business ventures that would actually expand the ability for OpenAI to actually build out their offering. And the board was getting jealous about that. Plus, the board didn't like the commercialization that was happening uh, for OpenAI. So that was creating the friction that led to this ouster by the board. But these are kind of things that should be happening inside companies, not outside companies destroying market caps. Uh, I mean, it's an $89 billion market cap that they were about to destroy until all these things unfolded. And Ray, shortly after his dismissal, uh, there was something of a revolt by staffers at OpenAI. And then, of course, we had the reinstatement of Sam Altman. What was all that about? 
Well, I think the board didn't realize that Sam Altman had that many friends and followers inside the employee base. Uh, but the big issue really was a lot uh, about related to the valuation. The company was about to do a secondary round or secondary offering market, which allows employees to sell their shares in a secondary market pre-IPO to be able to get that in place. Plus, that move to actually have Sam removed destroyed market cap. It was a market cap raid. Literally what happened was their $89 billion valuation would have been reduced to about $10 billion in the markets uh, unless, well, until Satya Nadella came in to say, hey, look, we'll bring Sam over here. We'll actually try to save some of this. Uh, and until they actually the board came back, where the board was actually, you know, until they announced their new board, uh, all this would have gone away. I mean, they would have lost $90 billion in market cap. Microsoft would have gained $90 billion without doing anything. And 49% of in the investment coming from Microsoft would have pretty much vanished with OpenAI had they not left the structure. So this is the best outcome OpenAI could have imagined, having the board back Sam Altman, having a brand new board that was more commercially aligned, mm -hmm. but finding the right balance between having responsible AI and being able to get to those commercial interests. Tom, uh, a New York Times headline this week described Sam Altman as, and I'm quoting here, the most prominent promoter of artificial intelligence. Another headline from New York Magazine in September said, OpenAI's CEO thinks he knows the future. What do we really know about Sam Altman? Why is he such a critical figure in this new technology? Well, I mean, he's very young. I think he's 38 years old. Uh, he's a product of Silicon Valley and attended Stanford, did all the kinds of things he would typically do. Uh, and he also had a, 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 a successful background as a venture capitalist. So he saw how companies can be successful and how they could, how they could you know, fall apart. Um, but I think that the reason he is the visionary of AI is ChatGPT. He, he got into the zeitgeist. He, made it so everyone can see the power of AI. Uh, and, you know, Google has been developing this technology for a long time, and other companies have, but it was Sam Altman who came up, you know, was, you know, had the company that came up with this idea of making it so it is available and easy to use for anybody. I think that's the power, and that's why he became so successful. Ian, um, there's lots of concern about the impact of AR, the kind of impact would it have on everything, almost every facet of our lives, you know, things from politics to the economy to medical science and things like this. Sam Altman, in fact, talked about some of this when he appeared before a congressional committee recently. Let's listen to part of what he had to say. My worst fears are that we cause significant, we, the field, the technology, the industry, cause significant harm to the world. Uh, I think that could happen in a lot of different ways. It's why we started the company. I think if this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong. Uh, and we want to be vocal about that. We want to work with the government to prevent that from happening. But we, we try to be very clear eyed about what the downside case is and the work that we have to do to mitigate that. So the question, Ian, I guess, is can AI be regulated? Can it be constrained? I mean, is it possible to put guardrails in place? It's, it's definitely possible to put guardrails on, on AI in general. Yes, the technology is very wide and it has broad applications from you know healthcare to transportation to education industry, name an industry, and AI can be applied to it. And after that, you've got generative AI, uh, such as ChatGPT. The possibilities haven't even started to emerge. And so, yes, it's possible that the future might be very dark. We might be risking everything. And for that, we have to develop some form of regulation, some form of guardrail that help us go where we need to go responsibly and where all the stakeholders, including the private sector, government, international participants, think tanks, and so on, are all working responsibly to create a future that doesn't harm people. And Ian, when you say uh, develop some kind of regulation, are we talking about self-regulation here or will you see perhaps action from Congress, uh, this actually being turned into laws? I think at uh, the beginning we have to have self-regulation and we're seeing a little bit of that happen. Uh, Congress has uh, also taken a little bit of part in that. President Biden has issued the executive order just recently. Europe is working on some kind of regulations. The Middle East is working on some kind of regulation. So I think all these scattered efforts need to combine in one uh, big effort to have a collaborative body, a governance body that can help everybody understand what to do. And the second phase would be to really provide rules, regulations, laws that help everybody uh, work with AI in a safe manner. Mm -hmm.
Amar Awadallah, um, according to a report in the New York Times, one open AI member warned that firing Altman could destroy the company, to which another replied, well, that would be consistent with the mission. Uh, you know, getting back to the point that Ray Wong made at the beginning of the show, I mean, to what extent was his firing caused by the fact that there was a huge dispute over the goal of this uh, company, um, you know, whether it be a for-profit company or whether it would be a non-profit company? Well, certainly the complex, <clears throat> the complex structure for how the company is formed, where you have a non-profit, that's the parent company, and then under the non-profit, there is a for-profit company that is actually a capped profit company, is a very complex structure that absolutely played a role in why this uh, happened in the way that it happened. Uh, that said, uh, I think in general, creating humane AI that is uh, responsible aligns well with also creating profits. They go hand in hand, and you can do them both uh, very well. So we don't know exactly what was the reasons, by the way, why the board took that action uh, to fire him. There is many conflicting information out there. There's no official reason for why they, they did do it. One of the reasons is this misalignment of goals that uh, some of the board members thought that he was commercializing stuff uh, too quickly and not paying attention to the safety behind the technology. That is one speculation that we have heard. The other one is uh, Sam has been going doing deals left and right with investors mm. without uh, checking with the, with the board and doing some of these deals for companies he's starting on the side as well that are not open eye related. So we don't know for sure. Uh, why uh, this happened the way that it, that it uh, took place. But clearly what happened is a misalignment between what Sam wanted to do and what the board thought was right. And I, to a small extent, uh, any CEO, I, I, I hold the CEO position right now, any CEO, if they get misaligned with their board, it's on them. They, they are accountable for that, especially if it reaches the point where they're getting fired. So something wrong must have happened there. And we're very glad to see it moving in the right direction right now. Amar, uh, of course, there is deep concern. Uh, we've heard it from many, many quarters over the impact of artificial intelligence, how it will be used, can it be abused in many respects. Um, but in this particular instance where it concerns open AI, I mean, was their core mission what? Helping humanity? Uh, yes, the core mission is to create an AI that's going to help us become uh, much better at everything that we do. And I have a great example that I love to use this. Many of us are using AI every day right now. We just don't know that we are. So Google Maps, for example, Google Maps, which is uh, we use it for navigating to getting from point A to point B, has tons of AI behind it, tons of AI that work on, on the images, stitching together the roads, the satellites, the, the photos in the streets, predicting the traffic. And now we all use it. We don't we don't even think there's AI, but it made all of us from being an average person that only knows how to go from point A to point B to now being able to go from any point to any point. That's the ultimate mission of, of AI, is to enable us to be able to do uh, everything, everything we would like to do in a, in a super and superior way. So, for example, one of the great applications OpenAI has is DALI. Uh, DALI is an incredible technology where you can describe a picture. In fact, the picture behind me in my background right now, I made, I, I'm not an artist. I don't know how to draw. I don't know how to use Photoshop. But I was able to go with DALI and iterate, oh, and put a skyscraper over there and put a panel over here and add a shadow and then add a light switch so it looks more real, et cetera, et cetera. And you can do like So I became an artist without needing to be an artist. And this is really what AI is about. It's going to allow us to become programmers. You'll be able to make mm -hmm. your own app by just describing what you would like the app to do. You'll be able to make your own art you'll even be able to make your own movies. So the next Steven Spielberg does not need to have all of the budget to create a movie like AT. You would be able to at home describe the movie. I would like this to happen here. I would like this to happen there. And the movie just comes out exactly like you wanted. This is what we're all building, is enabling that vision of allowing the average person to be a super person. Right. All of that actually sounds very exciting. Ray, you were telling us uh, a moment ago uh, about the fact that, you know, Microsoft came to the rescue while this was going on. And, uh, you know, at the time when uh, OpenAI's market cap was being reduced considerably to a fraction of uh, what it was believed to be, um, how do these two companies now function with each other? Oh, actually, I think they're in better place. Um, before, uh, Microsoft had 49% share of uh, OpenAI, but they didn't have any say. They wouldn't even have a board observer role. 
Now what they do is have a professional board, a bunch of professional board members in place that know how to work with large enterprises, that know how to tackle the ethical issues. And what you noticed in place here were people that have actually taken companies public, people that have actually been in place in understanding governance scenarios. So it's an, they're in a good place. Uh, I think investors and customers who are with OpenAI working with Microsoft should be breathing a sigh of relief. Uh, the fact that Sam is back in charge, Microsoft is providing some level of adult supervision, and the governance in place is going to be a lot easier for them to work in terms of building partnerships and, and actually sustaining the viability of open AI over time. So overall, it's a good deal for Microsoft. Uh, they were able to maintain their market cap in the middle of the emergency. Now they're able to actually work with open AI more closely. And in any case, Microsoft is behind open AI. Uh, people can see that, they feel that, and they realize that there is good guidance uh, on that end of the spectrum. Tom, there's a few things that are not going to happen. Uh, one of the things that Sam Altman has agreed to is that he will not be sitting on the new board. The other is also agreed to an internal investigation to find out what happened in the first place. What is the significance of all of this? I mean, how uh, different is the new board from the old board? Well, the, the new board, I think, like Ray mentioned, is probably probably more experienced uh, because you know when you fire your CEO, and we're talking, this is a big company here, and you fire him on a Friday uh, without really a good explanation of why you've done that, and sounds like not much deliberation, you got to question the, the board and, and, their, and the way they, they carry out actions. So I think, um, you know, it's, a, it's good that we have this board, but by having Altman not on there, um, I do think it's, it's, it was part of this negotiation that it sounded like it was very heated. It took a, a certain amount of time. Um, and so I think that's probably why he's not on the board. And then we had this investigation. I think if you are investigating the CEO, you probably don't want him on the board because the board's going to have to make a decision uh, about the CEO and, 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 you know, what the CEO did or did not do. So, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty. Although that message, that mm -hmm. press release that went out on, on Friday kind of sounded like he was guilty before, mm -hmm. you know, before any due process. So mm -hmm. now he's going to get some due process. And, you know, who knows, he may ultimately become part of the board. I don't know. And it sounds like there might be some other board members who will come on in the weeks and months ahead, too. OK, we need to take a break right now. More of our conversation when we return. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat. of business is to bring value. Business activities in Europe, Asia, and the U.S. reach consumers globally. Trade, manufacturing, energy, high-tech, real estate, consumption. We give an expanded view on global business and how it covers, influences, or relates to the whole world. Global business, only on CGTN. Welcome back. We're talking about artificial intelligence and the recent reinstatement of Sam Altman as CEO of OpenAI. Let's get back to our panel. Ian Khan, AI technology is moving at a very rapid pace, and there are, of course, huge profits to be made. Uh, but you know, there are some who want this technology to roll out very slowly. Uh, but I'm wondering, you know, could we get into a situation where profits would triumph ethics? Um, I mean, some have already warned that containment is not easy. And uh, <clears throat> for this, we have to consider what you asked me earlier is regulations and how we have a framework or what guardrails do we have. Right now, it's the wild, wild west of AI development. Anybody and everybody is free to develop whatever they want, however they see fit in terms of developing solutions, creating possibilities with AI technology. And there's so much in AI, like there's hundreds of different sub-technologies and uh, capabilities within AI. 
And unless we don't have some kind of a control on that, we really cannot say that, hey, AI is safe, AI is great, and it cannot be used for some ulterior motive. There's definitely a possibility that unregulated companies, uh, dark companies, you know, companies that are operating, uh, you know, behind, uh, you know, firewalls and, and, and on the black, on the dark net, may have technologies within AI that do something, uh, you know, that harms companies from a cybersecurity perspective. And it's already started to happen. Or you have, uh, you know, identity theft and other areas where uh, there might be uh, early mass adoption from certain groups and certain people. So, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's tricky. It's, uh, it's going to be difficult. But we have to come together, as I said, in order to have that clear path to profitability, to creating value, and to ensure that you know everybody is getting what they want from it, and people at the end of the day are safe from AI and its uh, and its impact. Amar Awadala, what is your view on this? I mean, we had Elon Musk, um, who says that he supported the initial ouster of Sam uh, Altman and says the public should be informed. Uh, We've lost Amar Abadal. Let me go to, back to Ray Wong. Uh, Ray, um, I mean, when we talk about the abuse of AI, um, what is the potential for that? Yeah, there are a lot of areas. Um, I think it's important, as um, you know, was saying, like, it's got to have level ethics. And we have a set of level one ethics that are important. Algorithms need to be transparent. We have to be able to see what's inside there. They can't be a black box. We also have to be able to explain them. What are the outcomes from the algorithms? What might happen? For example, if I'm discriminating against purple-headed, purple-haired people that are left-handed, and I didn't know that, well, hey, I need to go fix that and correct that. And reversibility becomes the third important pillar of that. And of course, it takes time to train these models so we're confident. 83% accuracy in a drive-out, you know, drive-through checkout, not too bad. 83% accuracy in procurement, not going to fly. 83% accuracy in healthcare, definitely a no-no, right? And of course, over time, we have to do think about where the human plays a loop. Where's the human in the loop? You start a process with a human, you end a process with a human, and that gives you some level of control. That has to be built into almost every one of these systems, and we've got to be able to do that to be able to feel that we're in good shape. The danger in AI is our ability, our loss of serendipity, our loss of human innovation, and that's what I'm worried about. For example, sometime in 2040, a hypersonic jet is going to hit a bird strike. There's 100 passengers on the plane, there's 10 million people below, the, hyper, the AI might say, you know what, we're going to kill the hyper, we're, we're going to actually, you know, scrub the hypersonic jet because that's 100 lives versus 10 million below. But wait, there's a 0.001% chance you could pull this off because some guy named Captain Scully landed a plane in the Hudson and that worked. I'm worried about the insurance policy if the pilot decides to take that on their own. And that's what we have to worry about because that human drive for innovation, that level of serendipity, our ability to do adventure is going to be de-risked by regulators and accountants and underwriters. There have also been, Ray, uh, concerns being expressed about, the, about AI being used by the military. In fact, we heard that. It was one of the issues that was discussed by uh, President Xi Jinping of China and President Biden at their summit uh, in San Francisco just a few days ago. Um, is that a valid concern? Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, the APEC summit, we already see AI being used, and it's being used for everything from logistics, supply routes, it's being used to identify vulnerabilities in cybersecurity. It's being used, I mean, we already see it in rocket launches. Look what Elon Musk is able to do with SpaceX. I mean, they can send a rocket up and land it completely without a human. Uh, so you're going to see more of that along with robotics as well. Oh, uh, great to have you back with us. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you that question about um, Elon Musk. I mean, he supported the initial ouster of Altman. Musk says the public should be informed on the reasons why Altman was fired. Um, he says he's worried that, you know, profits would uh, be paramount to the detriment of the core mission of helping humanity, which is what we spoke about just a few moments ago. What do you make of these concerns? What is your view? Yeah, so first I will note, I mean, Elon Musk uh, himself has his own AI company, XAI now. Uh, they built a large language model called uh, Grok, which is just like ChatGPT. So he is a competitor. So you have to take his words uh, at face value from, from that perspective. And I wouldn't say he supported the ousting. He, he was not surprised by it. Like he said, he was not surprised by it. Um, some folks might know that Elon Musk actually was one of the key founders of OpenAI. And he later on left when due to disagreements with Sam Altman. So there's some tension between them. So I would take his, I would calibrate his words against, uh, against that. Now, can can the technology be used for uh, for nefarious reasons? 
I am in the middle of the AI motion. Like we're building AI systems in, in my in my startup Victara. I can assure you, like AI systems are not any way you show up Skynet. It's not Skynet. Skynet is not the thing we should be afraid of. Uh, Skynet is this concept of the AI and Terminator that wakes up one day and kills all of us. N not even close. We're not even close to something like that. What is concerning is how the, the technology could be abused, right? In the same way, when cars came out, we had cars in the very early days, you could use these cars to kill people. You could run over other people with a car until we came up with laws that says, no, you can only use the car to go from point A to point B. You're not supposed to use the car to kill people. And then later on, we found out that people still would make accidents and die from that. So we added the seatbelt and we added the airbag. And the same thing will happen with AI. That's my fear is there will be, because of how fast it's moving, we might not add these controls, whether that be technology or laws, that prevent us from using it in a bad way. A couple of quick examples. Mm -hmm. I can copy your voice right now, literally repeat your voice word for word as if I'm you, call up your bank and issue a wire transfer. That should be made illegal. It should be illegal for me to copy your voice without your permission. So that's some, some of the regulations that we should uh, expect to see in, in the days ahead of us. Uh, AI can also be used uh, to find cures for diseases. Thanks to uh, AI, we were able to find the vaccines for COVID really, really fast. But guess what? AI could also be used to find new types of viruses like COVID way quicker than we could ever before. That would not be safe right. in the average person's hands. So we have to control that with laws. Ian, we've been talking about uh, OpenAI as well as Microsoft. What about other companies like Google, like Meta? Uh, where are they in this technology? So everybody who has the resources, they've got the funding, they have a focus, they are deeply vested into, uh, into AI development and uh, adding it to what they have already. We've heard uh, something from, uh, from Facebook or Meta. We've heard uh, you know, Google is developing, again, its own platform. Uh, NVIDIA, which is a chip company, is, is an AI company. They have a huge, massive AI development that powers their chips. So mm -hmm. I don't believe AI will remain at the back. I think right. it's, a, it's, a, it's an era of a lot of hype right now where everybody wants to have a startup. They want to have a company and use yeah. AI from public, private sector into what have you. So yeah, I see a lot more happening uh, in the next few years. Tom, I've got less than a minute left, in fact, about 40 seconds. Uh, what kind of breakthroughs do you see for AI in the near future? Well, you know, we, who predicted ChatGPT? I mean, not even Google could figure that out. So, you know, I do think that the, the next couple of years, uh, we have this thing called the transformer model that is at the core of this. And I think we're reaching our limits with that, and especially data. We're running out of data to train. Yeah. So I think a couple of things are, that we'll see is going beyond the, the transformer model, maybe yeah. quantum computing, and then also figuring out new ways to create new data to make these models even better and stronger. Okay, and that is where we have to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnon Naidu in Washington, D.C.